Let us pray. Open our eyes and soften our hearts, O God, through the work of your Holy Spirit, that in the hearing of your word we may receive new life. Amen. Our reading from Acts this morning is from chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God knows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Our Easter Sunday epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now I should remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaimed to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to someone ultimately born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim and so you have come to believe. Our gospel this blessed day is from John chapter 20, verses one through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrapping lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrapping lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrapping, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb 
and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, please tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he said these things to her. The word of the Lord. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a Christian martyr in the last century, being executed by Hitler two weeks before the war ended, said that ministers should write their sermons out in manuscript form, believing that by every idle word you shall be judged. And I have followed that advice. In 42 years, I've never gotten a pulpit on a Sunday morning without a manuscript in front of me until today. Uh, Bonhoeffer also said, once you've written it out in manuscript form, you should memorize it. Um, I didn't follow that part because I never finished early enough on a Saturday night to... But yesterday I read something that just would not let go of me and I knew I had to rewrite the sermon that I had prepared. I didn't actually make that decision until 5.30 this morning. So this is as fresh as it's gonna get. <laughs> What do you say when Ash Wednesday is on Valentine's Day? Anyone for fish and dark chocolate? <laughs> what do you say when Easter is on April Fool's Day? Christ is dead. April Fool. Or the more cynical, Christ is risen. April Fool. And there's one I saw recently on Facebook it said, Christ died for our sins, but he didn't stay dead. So what did he really give up? A weekend? Christ gave up a weekend for our sins. And my comment on that was, to be fair, it was a holiday weekend. <clears throat> a favorite dramatic illustration of 10 evangelists was to take a dirty glass and hold it up where everyone can see it. That represents sinners like you and me. And then to take a hammer and raise the hammer back and bring it down to smash the glass, which is God's wrath giving us what we deserve. And then at the last instant, to put a tin pie plate between the glass and the hammer. And so when the hammer hits it, it makes a loud noise and that represents Christ intervening on our behalf. Good dramatization, but poor theology. Because that illustration assumes that Christ came to thwart God's will. That Christ's actions oppose God's will. And Christ said, the Father and I are one. The Nicene Creed says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. 
The will of the Father and the Son are the same. Christ did not come to oppose God's will or to change God's mind. Christ came to express God's mind and to change our minds about God. God is not a vengeful God out to get us. God is a loving God out to save us. On Ash Wednesday, Valentine's Day, 17 young people were killed in Parkland, Florida. Since then, the survivors have been outspoken about the experience they survived and their 17 friends who did not. The grandparents of one of the victims live in Cincinnati. I find it easy to admire them for their courage, their strength in surviving and trying to work some good out of the tragedy. Not everyone feels that way. One person has said that they're children and should not express political opinions. Trevor Noah said that if you're old enough to be shot, you're old enough to have an opinion about being shot. One news personality trolled one of the survivors in an ad hominem attack. But the one that disturbed me yesterday was from a member of the NRA's board who said that the Parkland survivors do not have souls. Now, I don't understand the reasoning for making that statement. But since God is the one who gives us souls, I've concluded that it is way beyond this speaker's pay grade. It's easy to judge the statement and attack the one who made it. It's easy to defend the survivors and describe them as being the incarnation of good. It is more difficult to find anything redeeming or edifying in the claim that these young people do not have souls and by extension to find anything redeemable about the person who would say it. God did. And God sent Jesus to die for that sin as well as for my sin. God loves that person and wants that person not to perish but have eternal life. Even that person is one of the least of Christ's brothers and sisters. Even that person is one whom God expects us to love, requires us to love. God desires it. Faith requires it because God loves me and God loves you. And we are in as much need of redemption, of salvation as that person. That's the hard work for me this Easter. Dorothy Day said, I really only love God as much as I love the person I love the least. But that's also the good news of Easter. One way of looking at it is that when Christ told Peter to put away his sword in the garden, Christ disarmed all Christians against the use of violence, even to defend Christ. We are to find a different way. Frederick Beekner wrote a book titled Peculiar Treasures. It's a who's who of biblical characters. In the character sketch of Mary Magdalene, he wrote, she seems to have teamed up with Jesus early in the game and to have stuck with him to the end and beyond. It's at the end that she comes into focus most clearly. She was one of the women who was there in the background when he was being crucified. She was also one of the ones who was there when they put what was left of him in the tomb. But the time that you see her best was on the first Sunday morning after his death. John is the one who gives the greatest detail. And according to John, it was still dark when he went into the tomb to discover that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance and that inside it was empty as a drum. 
She ran back to wherever the disciples were hiding out to tell them, and Peter and one of the others returned with her to check out her story. They found out that it was true and that there was nothing except some pieces of cloth the body had been wrapped in. They left then, but Mary stayed on outside the tomb someplace and started to cry. Two angels came and asked her what she was crying about, and she said, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they had laid him. She wasn't thinking in terms of anything miraculous. She was thinking simply that even in death, they wouldn't let him be, and somebody had stolen his body. Then another person came up to her and asked, what, asked her the same questions. Why was she crying? What was she doing there? She decided it must be somebody in charge, like the gardener maybe. And she said if he was the one who had moved the body somewhere else, would he please tell her where it was so she could go there? Instead of answering her, he spoke her name, Mary. And then she recognized who he was and though from that instant forward, the whole course of human history was changed in so many profound and complex ways that it's impossible to imagine how it would have been different otherwise. For Mary Magdalene, the only thing that had changed was that for reasons she was in no state to consider, her old friend and teacher and strong right arm was alive again. Rabona, Rabona, she shouted, was about to throw her arms around him for sheer joy and astonishment when he stopped her. Don't touch me, he said. Don't hold on to me. Thus making her not only the first person in the world to have her heart stop beating for a second, to find him alive again when she thought he was as dead as a doornail but the first person also to have her heart break a little, to realize that he, he couldn't be touched anymore, a shoulder to weep on, because the life in him was no longer a life she could know by touching it, with her here and with him here too, but a life she could only know by living it, with her here and him here too, alive inside her life to raise her up also out of the wreckage of all that was wrecked in her and dead. In the meanwhile, he had much to do and far to go. And so did she. The first thing she did was to go back to the disciples to report, I have seen the Lord. And whatever dark doubts they might have had on the subject earlier, one look at her face was enough to melt them all away like the morning mist. Bigner also wrote that all major Christian creeds affirm belief in the resurrection of the body. In other words, they affirm the belief that what God, in spite of everything, prizes enough to bring back to life is not just some disembodied echo of a human being, but a new and revised version of all the things which made that person the particular human being he or she was and which he or she needs something like a body to express. Personality, the way one looked, the sound of one's voice, one's peculiar capacity for creating and loving, in some sense, one's face. It was that embodied Jesus Christ that Mary saw. She heard the sound of his voice and saw his face. On Easter, we celebrate the resurrection and the gift to us of eternal life. What we see is what the unspeakable love of God has done and is doing. The life we see in Christ is the life God offers us because that's the way God is. The good news had broken through and human life was changed. No longer do we have to fight fire with fire. We can fight fire with water, to use baptismal language. 
or whatever image we use to describe the kind and gentle grace of Christ. Because the power of the resurrection is changing us as we live into the people who can love as Christ loves us. On Easter, God had a very good day. And it's the best day human beings ever had too. Because we have seen the Lord. Amen. Let us stand and say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.